Thank you very much. Um, this is my first TED Talk. So as a good academic, I, of course, researched how one gives a TED Talk. So um, here's my checklist of things that I need to do. I need to smile. Ideally, you'll smile as well if I'm smiling. The second thing I need to do is I need to emphasize the intensity of the observations I'm making by speaking with my hands near my head. If you look at successful TED Talks on YouTube, a lot of the speakers do that. Um, third thing, of course, is to draw you in with an engaging story from immediately um, so that you look forward to a quarter of, a quarter of an hour of, 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 of entertainment. Now, things that I shouldn't do. Now, these are not just things that you shouldn't do in the TED Talk, but these are things you shouldn't do in public speaking in general, and especially not when students have been sitting exams. Number one, shouldn't talk about maths. Number two, you shouldn't talk about proofs in mathematics. That's even worse. So, where are we going with this? I'm going to talk about using computers to prove theorems. And so we're going to drive straight through the red X's here. Um, I'm still smiling, and I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be <laughs> smiling as well. First proof we're going to look at is Euclid's proof that there's no largest prime number. This is about 2,300 years old. It's going to take me about 30 seconds to tell you all of the theory that you need as background to the proof. And then we're going to walk through the proof. The proof is going to be four steps. And in about two and a half minutes, you're going to understand the proof. OK, so Euclid says there's no largest prime number. That's his theorem. What's a prime number? A prime number is a number that's only divisible by itself and by one. So let's look at some examples. Two is a prime number, because it's only divisible by itself, two, and by one. Similarly, three is a prime number. It's only divisible by itself and one. It's not evenly divisible by two. Three divided by two is one and a half. That's not a whole number. Now, our first non-prime number, four, because it is divisible by two. OK, you get the picture. This keeps going. Five, prime, six, not prime, et cetera. So how does Euclid's theorem work? He says, let's start, as, remember, there are four steps in this proof. The first step is let's suppose there is a largest prime number. Remember, he's going to prove that there's not a largest prime number. So he's going to start by assuming something that he's going to then try and show you leads to a contradiction. So we're starting by assuming there is a largest prime number. We're going to call it p prime. OK, so we've got this number p. The second thing we're going to do, step two, is we're going to define a new number called q. Q is going to be much bigger than p, because here's how we're going to form q. 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times so on, all the way up to times p. So it's, it's p times a lot of other numbers. So q is really big at this point. If p was the largest prime number you could think of, q is far larger than it. Now, the number that we're really interested in is q plus 1. And q plus 1 is interesting because q itself is a multiple of all of these other numbers, from 2 all the way up to p. So q is divisible by 2, it's divisible by 3, it's divisible by 4, it's divisible by all of these other things, all the way up to p. But q plus 1 isn't. If you try and divide q plus 1 by 2, you're going to get something and a half, because q is divisible by 2. If you try and divide q plus 1 by 3, you're going to get something and a third. If you try and divide it by, q, uh, by 4, you're going to get something and a quarter, and so on. Because it's just one bigger than all of these multiples. So q plus 1 can't be evenly divided by any number between 2 and p. This leaves us with one of two possibilities. Either q plus 1 itself is a prime number and can't be expressed as the product of smaller prime numbers, in which case we've contradicted our initial assumption that p is the largest prime number because q is larger than it. The second possibility is that q plus 1 isn't a prime number, in which case it can be expressed as the product of smaller prime numbers. But because none of those are between 2 and p, there has to be a larger prime number than p. <laughs> That's excellent. You're smiling. Good. Even some laughs. OK. So it worked. This was a, this was a gamble. Um, but you're smiling. I'm smiling. OK, so that's the proof. That's Euclid's proof. This is four lines. This is 2,300 years ago. Mathematics has come on considerably since then. Proofs have gotten longer. There was a recent um, monograph, two books, in fact, that took 1,200 pages to prove its main results. Now, at this point, it's really unclear what the authors are doing when they claim to have proved something. Their proofs will not be read by more than a handful of people on the planet. Um, even those people who do read them and who have the expertise to understand them will not be able to certify that they have agreed that every single step follows from the previous step. So when someone claims to have proved something over the course of 1,200 pages, are they making an artistic statement? Are they making a scientific statement? What are they doing at this point? Where, and then where does this leave mathematics, modern mathematics? 
So a, a, one possible answer to this question was first suggested by Leibniz, who about 350 years ago, along with Newton, founded calculus. He had another thought. He had a vision of a time when machines would be capable of reasoning. And if you had a question, you could take it to machines and you could say, calculemos, let's calculate. And the machines would compute answers for you by following a set, a set of logical operations. His dream is beginning to become a reality and that's primarily what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. One of the highest profile successes of his dream in fact predates his, um, his own life. Prior to, uh, prior to Leibniz's life, Johannes Kepler, the astronomer, was given a problem to think about, about how to pack cannonballs on a ship. We've already heard about Darwin sailing for five years. Ships in those times sailed for long periods of time, and if you wanted anything on that ship, you had to pack it at the beginning. You'd be at sea for six months, for a year, and so efficiently packing everything on that ship was a big problem. If you couldn't pack the cannonball in the first place, it wasn't gonna be there six months from now when you were on the other side of the, of, of the world. So for about 400 years, this problem remained an open problem, hence a conjecture. But in 1998, an American mathematician called Thomas Hales came up with a solution, what he thought was a solution to it. So he's an academic, he seeks to publish his, his solution to this, so he submits it to a journal. Now the problem is that his solution is 120 pages long and is accompanied by a half gigabyte of computer files. Typically, when you submit a paper to a journal, the editor sends the paper to two, possibly three referees, and in maybe six months, they write back with a decision on the paper. In Hales's case, the editor sent the paper to a team of 12 referees. It took them five years, at the end of which they reported back that they were 99% certain that the proof was correct, but they didn't have the time or the energy to pursue it any further. The editor threw up his hands and published the paper anyhow. So Hales, you could have thought, would have been really excited by this. He solved an open problem that's been around for 400 years. But he was disappointed because he said 99% isn't good enough in mathematics. So he took his 120 page proof and he decided he was going to encode it so that a machine could check every step of it. People thought he was crazy. They said, look, go on and you don't make your name in mathematics by, by doing this. You make your name by solving the problem in the first place, which you've done. Um, but he did that and he's finally completed that project. There are a couple of other successes of this mechanized reasoning approach within pure mathematics. Um, whoops, this is the wrong direction. One of them is, in fact, predates um, Hales' solution to, to Kepler's conjecture. This is the four color map problem. You take a map on a sheet of paper, you uh, draw regions on it. The question is, if you want to color in those regions so that no two adjoining regions can share a color, how many colors does it take to do so? The four color map theorem says it takes four. This was believed for a long time, but finally in the 1970s, computers were actually able to grind through all of the possible cases and establish its truth. So in that case, the computers were being used for calculation rather than for reasoning. Another, perhaps the, the more startling success was to solve a problem that dates from the beginning of the 20th century called Robin's conjecture about algebra. In that case, a computer actually found a proof, a very short proof that a human could have found before a human found it. Otherwise, in pure mathematics, these tools have largely not delivered on the promises that people had originally expected of them in, in the 1960s. They have been more successful these mechanized reasoning tools in, in more applied domains. So in hardware design, for example, and in software design, I'll give you an example from each of these, then I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing with them. If you design a computer chip, you can think of that computer chip as a series of, 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 of very simple logical statements. Computer chips are composed of, of gates. Standard gates are AND gates or OR gates. A very simple AND gate works like this. You take one signal coming in, a second signal coming in. If that first signal is a one, and the second signal is a one, you get a one out the other side. If only the first signal is a one, but the second signal is not a one, you get a zero out the other side. So you've got a computer chip, it looks very complicated, it's a series of AND gates and OR gates, and so you can write it as a series of logical statements, one, AND, two, OR, three, et cetera. A big complex chip becomes a big complex list of these logical statements. That defines a logical universe. In that logical universe, you can prove theorems. Why would you want to prove theorems in the logical universe of a chip? Well, in the mid-1990s, Intel shipped a new Pentium chip. Sometime afterwards, it was discovered that if you fed it division problems, roughly once in every nine billion division problems that you fed it, it would make an error of up to 0.006%. An apparently very small, infrequent error, but they were forced to recall all of their chips. They spent about a half billion dollars doing so. So since then, what Intel has done is when it designs a chip, 
it takes that logical universe that represents the chip design and it says, let's prove that this chip design has all of the properties that we want the chip to have. Let's prove, for example, that it correctly implements this division that we want it to be able to do. And that's how they've managed to avoid similarly embarrassing uh, recalls since then. So that's hardware design. Software design is more obvious because when you write a piece of code, you have defined a logical universe in that code system. Why would you want to use a computer to double check that for you? You write the code, why don't you just check it yourself? Modern software projects run to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of code. So a big software project will have more lines of code than a single human could write in her lifetime, much less check. You simply cannot read the code, keep track of all of the dependencies in your head, et cetera. But this is something that a computer can do very well. It's fast, it doesn't get bored, it's a simple task. So these techniques have been used very successfully, primarily in transport. So a lot of train systems now are driven by computers. Uh, humans do not sit in the fronts of the trains. And you wanna make sure that the code that's controlling these trains isn't going to schedule two trains into the same location at the same time. This turns out to be a theorem that you can prove in the logical universe of that code. So these are the high profile successes and then there's what we're doing. We're trying to take these techniques and apply them to, problem, to, to auction problems. Many of you will have first-hand experiences with auctions. You may have bought things on eBay, for example. If you've got a mobile phone, the signal that it uses was, was won by your, your mobile phone operator in an auction. The, uh, the painting behind us is, an is, a, is a painting depicting the, the, the oldest known auction, which must be the oldest knowable auction as well, because it comes from Herodotus' histories. He describes a practice in Babylon whereby women were auctioned off to prospective husbands. It's not a practice that survived very long, I think. Um, modern auction theory starts much later than Herodotus. Modern auction theory starts in 1961, when William Vickery analyzes what are called second price auctions. Second price auction is a very simple auction. Everyone writes a bid down on a piece of paper. They slip the paper into an envelope. The envelopes get submitted to an auctioneer. The auctioneer opens. The, the envelopes finds the highest bid. The person who wrote that wins the auction but doesn't pay the price that they wrote. They pay the second highest price that's been written down. That's why it's called a second price auction. So this seems like a bit of a strange auction, but Vickery was able to prove, and this is Vickery's theorem, that an auction like this has two very nice properties. The first is that truth-telling is weakly dominant. So what that means is that if you're trying to figure out what number you should write down on your slip of paper, write down what the thing is worth to you. You don't need to think about what anyone else is doing. Regardless of what anyone else is doing, you can't do better than writing down what it's worth to you. You don't need to hire an auction theorist. You don't need a team of consultants. Just think about what it's worth to you and write it down. So that's obviously a very nice property for an auction to have. The second property that it has is that it's efficient. What efficient means is that it's gonna allocate the good to whoever values it the most. Again, that's a nice property to have as well. If you're a government and you're running a spectrum auction for mobile phone licenses, you wanna make sure that those are gonna go to the people who can use them the most so that the spectrum isn't being wasted. So, Vickery's theorem, the proof is a bit longer than Euclid's theorem, um, but not much longer. So our first step in this area has been to take Vickery's theorem and encode it in four different theorem proving environments. Um, we hope that people will be very excited about this. Modern auction theorists tell us that they've believed Vickery's theorem for the last 50 years and so they don't need a computer proof of it. This isn't surprising. And more generally, proofs in auction theory aren't terribly long. So we can keep encoding proofs in auction theory. This isn't gonna solve a lot of open problems. Instead, the problem that auction theorists do seem to have, they tell us, is that the theory base is pretty limited. So when you go to design a new auction now, well, let, I'll give you very quickly a, um, an example. The, um, in the United States, there's going to be a new spectrum auction that's going to simultaneously reallocate spectrum from radio and television stations to mobile broadband. So you're not just allocating spectrum on one end, but you're reallocating it on the other end as well. An auction like this is going to be extremely complicated. There are not going to be simple theorems like Vickery's theorem that describe how it should work. The problem, the real concern that the regulators have and that the auction designers have in these cases is, is my auction going to fall over halfway through? There are gonna be billions of pounds at stake here. If the auction starts and then stumbles some way along the way, this is going to be extremely expensive and extremely embarrassing. So how can you prove that your auction design is going to function properly when it goes live? Now typically the way that you do that is you have a team of graduate students, you pay them in pizza and Coke, and they, they play the auction for months on end 
and then you take it live. So you've maybe run it thousands of times. Have you found all of the bugs in the auction design? You don't know yet. So this is the second thing that we've been doing then. We've taken these auction designs, we've encoded them in the formal language of these theorem proving systems, and we can prove formal properties on them, like the auction will come to a unique outcome. It will allocate the goods to certain parties and they will pay positive prices. So this isn't just something that we've said that we've play tested, but you can prove this now. Second, as a side effect, when we encode the auction design in the first place, we do so using what's called a constructive logic. If you, a constructive logic says how the auction is supposed to work. Now, as soon as you say how the auction is supposed to work, you're already halfway to having computer code because computer code says what you're supposed to do next as you write the code. So with a constructive logic basis for the code that defines the auction, we can automatically generate executable code to run the auction. So normally, when an auction designer designs an auction, the auction designer then hands off the design to someone to actually code up to run efficiently. That introduces the possibility of transcription errors. That possibility is removed by our technique. So, in conclusion, uh, Leibniz's dream is becoming a reality. Computers are being used to prove theorems. They're being used to do so in pure mathematics. They're being used to do so in hardware design, in software design. We're hoping to use these techniques to make auctions more reliable. The techniques are still in their infancy, um, but you can see, I think a useful analogy is to think of, of driverless cars. Driverless cars also have to perform very complex tasks without human intervention, and they're just getting to the point where they're becoming very interesting. And I hope these techniques are as well. Thank you.